man thank you for joining the show yeah it's it's awesome to be here uh chatting with you yeah so uh, we were just catching up uh completely coincidentally you are in my hometown of arlington washington <laughs> probably I, the I, biggest small world moment of my life honestly i would i would have to say so like usually when i say arlington people are like oh texas is lovely i'm like no <laughs> not texas um so yeah, it's that's incredible. And so, you know, maybe we can start there, right? Because uh, you know, in the intro, you know, I'm gonna let everyone know you work for Renaissance Periodization, but it sounds like you've built a pretty flexible lifestyle for yourself. Yeah, working for RP or Renaissance Periodization um has been has been awesome because it's allowed me to be mobile. Uh I, my wife and I, I'll hit you with the the crazy point up front. We live in yeah, a please. we live in an R V, like one of those bus style RVs that old folks like do the snowbird thing. <laughs> that's um, awesome. That, that's that's what we live in, and I'm I'm sitting in the back of my RV garage office right now on my my desktop. So, oh, right on. So, do you guys? I mean, fair to say you do a lot of traveling. Oh yeah, yeah. Two month two months in the summer we'll spend in Washington, and then the rest of the time we're we might spend seven to fourteen days roughly in in one location, and then jump to the next kind of just following the sun. Oh, cool. Well, and you know, one of the things I was going to ask you, and maybe we can, we can, I mean, start here, even though it's a little out of order, but, uh, I mean, you are a competitive cyclist at this point in your life. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is certainly competitive. Um, I, so she cycles as well. Yeah. So she's, she's a cat one cyclist, which there's five categories in cycling. Um, cat yeah, one being Cat, cat yeah, could you explain sort of like, how that works a little bit? I was I was digging yeah. into that last night, and I, I found it really interesting. Yeah, so uh, Cat 1 means like international level, professional level cyclist. Uh, cat 2 is nationally competitive. Uh, cat 3 is uh, regionally competitive. Uh, cat 4 is sort of like local state level competitive, and Cat mm -hmm. 5 is beginner. Um, so I'm a, I'm a Cat 3 on the road, uh, and Michelle's a Cat 1. So she's she's... She, honestly, she's faster than me at everything that lasts more than a minute. So in, <laughs> in like a one minute sprint, I can still probably beat her. Um, right. But every, everything other than that, she will beat me. Oh, that's incredible. And, and what I found was so interesting is like the way that you move through categories. Like it's and stop me if I'm getting any of this incorrect. It's not sure. inherently about how fast you are. Right. There, there's all that's sorts correct, of yeah. like, kind of like criteria and qualifications that you have to meet to officially move to a next category correct yeah it comes down to mostly placing in races and winning races and scoring points by winning against uh, uh other riders and, and certain numbers of riders and yeah basically you just have to win races to move up got it so if she's category one uh you know wh what sort of competitions is she taking place in uh she competed in nationals this year um and she's competed at like major stage races like the Tucson Bicycle Classic or Valley of the Sun down in Arizona. Um, and she's competed at some pretty uh, highly competitive criterium races, which are it's like okay. hot laps around a city block with a big show and like a big crowd. Um, so there's like um, BC Super Week is a, a week straight of competition every night uh, under the lights with like people whining and dining, watching the race. Um, and is that, did you say BC, British Columbia? Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. It's like one of the biggest criteria, maybe maybe the biggest criterium series in the world. Cash cash prizes for winning, like, I think there's like $150,000 uh, at, at the race series for oh, the women. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And so, you know, and I, I definitely want to dive into your athletic background because just that alone, I feel like we could probably speak for an entire hour. Um, you know, but are, are, it sounds like she's cat one, you're cat three. Um, are you, is there like a, an end goal in terms of like either some sort of event that you want to qualify for or some sort of like championship that ultimately like both of you are trying to work towards? Yeah. So for, for her, yeah, she's got really big goals and I will, I'll, I would have to let her chat about those. Um, mm -hmm. but, but for me, 
um it's just for fun i i mean i okay. i enjoy going and taking money from a race and coming home with a hundred dollars <laughs> i mean it's not a professional <laughs> endeavor for me at all um, okay i think i won 15 bucks and posted about posted about it on instagram last year hey um, there we go or you win some coffee uh, <laughs> so no 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 serious goals for me i'd like to like uh, win a cat three redmond derby days criterium or something it's like a local local event um that that'd be fun but no i I don't i honestly don't train seriously enough anymore to uh to merit any big goals i just do it for fun i I do it mostly mostly because i love riding my bike i love hard 20 mile rides i love hard 100 mile rides uh, and i just love riding my bike with my wife well and like where you're at right now is such a beautiful part of the country like yeah you know i summer it's amazing Man, you know, I try and tell people all the time because everyone has this picture of Seattle as gray, overcast, rains <laughs> all the time. And I'm like, OK, listen, in part, that's true. Yes, but, like, very. There, there is no better place to be in the world than like the Pacific Northwest in the summer. It's, For it's, sure. it's just beautiful. There's no humidity. It's green, partly because like, you're, you know, the bill came due in the winter. And yes, it did rain a lot. Yeah. Um, but oh, I'm jealous. I'm I'm over here in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. I technically work out or pre-pandemic. I used to work out in New York City. Okay, got um, it. But uh, yeah, I live in Eastern PA, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, minus like mountains, it, it, there's a lot of similarities over here. So I don't think I'll ever get to make my way back home. But uh, you know, this is this is a pretty good place to be stuck, so to speak. Cool. <laughs> um. Well, so, you know, you talked about no longer cycling being like a, a truly competitive endeavor for you, but historically, um, you have, you have a pretty cool athletic background. Uh, if you don't mind, c- could we start, uh, just by kind of hearing a little bit about, um, you know, your journey to where you are today and, and some of the various stops along the way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I sort of, I'll hit the, the pinnacle and then work, work up to it. Um, I, awesome. I, I, competed for team usa as a bobsledder um i competed at the world championships uh in both two-man and four-man as uh as a brakeman um Mm. so that was not where i intended being when i was like 14 years old dreaming of being a professional athlete i thought i was going to be a baseball player um so yeah (laughs) i i I never even made varsity uh as a baseball player in high school Um, (laughs) i i was really small in high school like I, I didn't really hit my, my growth spurt or start lifting weights until my junior year of high school. So, okay. uh, yeah, never could really contribute on the diamond um, when you when you weigh 110 pounds. Um, See, and that's that's so interesting because, like, when I think bobsled, and I think that's probably where this story ends up, but you think, like, explosive, incredibly powerful athlete. Yep. It's, yep. it's so interesting to hear that from your perspective – it's like in high school, even as a junior, like you didn't feel like athletically, you know what I mean? You, you yeah. were developed enough to make the varsity baseball team. I feel like people will kind of be like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I was definitely a late bloomer. Uh, and I think that's part of what made my fire so strong for competition. Mm. I mean, I was always super competitive. Like I made like little baseball, little league, all-star teams. And I was, I was really competitive uh, in nature growing up, but I, yeah, I didn't really become gifted um gifted athletically until i started lifting weights which Mm -hmm. was junior year um, and i went from i don't remember how much i weighed at the beginning of junior year probably 120 130 and i think by the end of junior year i was like 175 180 pounds and i had stacked on a silly amount of muscle um (laughs) and i mean yeah it was just the gift of teenage testosterone yeah absolutely Uh, so yeah i got i got ripped and discovered myself as as a like i discovered what confidence was um (laughs) because of the weight room and eventually i went out for the track team um and i did have like a good arm in baseball so i went out for the track team and started throwing javelin was successful there but not like not incredibly successful i didn't i never went to state i remember Hmm. actually i my uh was it my my senior year i went to the state qualifier which i think was at your high school um was it at arlington oh man do you, do you what, remember? What, what year did you graduate high school uh oh six 
Oh, six. Okay. I was oh five. Oh, okay. That was the year. Holy shit. We must have. So I threw Javelin. We, we must have. have okay, okay, yeah. We, we, we probably were standing next to each other at one point. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. I'm trying to remember because I think my senior year qualifiers were at Arlington. People listening, they, they, like uh, people listen to the show in India. They're like, what are these two talking about? Yeah, Arlington, yeah. Washington. Did, um, did we mention that like this, we didn't meet because we were from Arlington or from the area around Arlington. We met through like a New York. Uh, oh yeah. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't think we did. No. So we met through uh, Thomas White and you know, I want to get Thomas on the uh, podcast as well. Cause he also has just a great story. And uh, yeah, we met through the, the D10 decathlon different than the decathlon that I know you did in college. Um, and he actually, I think lives in Houston or right outside of it. And so, oh, yeah, okay. we, uh, you, yeah, you and I actually got connected through someone I met in New York who lives in Houston and now we're back to, back to Arlington. Yeah. Crazy, <laughs> crazy small world. Um, yeah. So I, th I threw javelin there, never qualified for state. Um, and I think I ran the 400 and the 300 hurdles in high school. I pole vaulted, did some shot put, some discus, but yeah, never, never qualified for state, never was anything special in anybody else's eyes. Uh, hmm. But I had started, I had started to think about the decathlon and like in the back of my mind, well, in the forefront of my mind, but I never really expressed it to, to a lot of folks. I, yeah. I, I wanted really big things in the decathlon because I started to see some of my potential. Um, and so I had like Olympic sized dreams in the decathlon, um, which was laughable at the time because I was like, <laughs> Uh, anybody anybody who doesn't know what the decathlon is it's 10 events in track and field scored on a scoring table 9000 is roughly the world record i was scoring like 5000 um and to to even sniff at the olympics you have to be scoring like 8300 8400 so i was like nowhere in the ballpark so there's some gr some ground to be made up yeah so i had those olympic dreams from age like 17 e even though i was i wasn't in the ballpark um and i i went and did track at western did the decathlon there and started to uh, excel a bit more um yeah i i set the school record at western washington university uh, in the decathlon and the javelin. That's and, incredible. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I mean, Western, for those for those who don't know, Division II school. Um, and what I love about track is at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what division you're at because everything is so measurable. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and again, Western is a fantastic school in its own right as well. Um, on a side note, I remember, yeah, because growing up in the Western Washington area and I, I played football in college, um, I remember Western had a decent football program for a really long time. And they were one of those like first schools that just cut the program. Oh yeah. So, I mean, I, I saw those guys coming out of the, their, their, their meeting with the, I think it was the university president basically saying like teams cut and they were all teary eyed. It was pretty, yeah, what you, pretty wild. What, what do you do? It's crazy. Um, okay. So, so you start having a tremendous amount of success at track and, and let me ask you, so it sounds like you always had um, an incredible amount of like belief and confidence in yourself. And, uh, you know, I don't know how deep you're willing to get, but I mean, like for you, where, where did that come from? Because it sounds like, you know, developmentally, like it took a while for your body to catch up with like what you knew you were capable of. Yeah, I, I would say I probably lacked confidence through middle school and high school. Um, but I, I think I had the foundation for, for confidence laid by my parents and I'm incre oh, okay. incredibly thankful for that because I think I was shown what what unconditional love was by my parents mm. and that's I mean that's a gift that um that, that I definitely don't take for granted and it 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 set me up to uh I guess I don't know how to put it be be free emotionally to believe in myself and um yeah it was just a gift from my parents I love that. And, and that's one of those things that I think is so uh, just critical because there are a lot of parents who listen. Um, I, I get reached out from time to time, folks who listen and they want to know, hey, how can I apply this for my kid? And yeah. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm probably not the right place to start, but I'm happy to point you to some, some people who know a lot more than I do. Um, but right like that, that's just such a good piece of life advice. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like people respond so much better to positive reinforcement. Oh, and, one one hundred percent. 
And I've, I've, you know, you probably you can relate to this as well. I've had coaches who take both approaches mm-hmm. on all ends of the spectrum. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, all the way from the dictator to maybe someone who uh, didn't wasn't wasn't uh, stern enough. Sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, man. I mean, just you know, when when you get, especially a young athlete, when you put them in a situation where it's like safe to fail, but there's reinforcement. They know, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, having having the the deep trust that your superiors, your family, your 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 parents and your coaches will still love you when or if and when you fail, um, but they are also like hoping to see you strive for excellence. That's mm-hmm. powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So, w- what took place in college then? Uh, where you went from, you know, kind of like in your words, uh, you know, not not um, performing at anywhere near what would be considered someone on an Olympic track in high school yeah. to all of a sudden breaking, you know, Western's all-time decathlon and I think javelin record you said as well, right? Yep, that's correct. Yeah, so what happened? Um, I started writing my own training plans. Uh, so I, I became interested in exercise science uh, primarily from a selfish perspective i just wanted to run faster (laughs) throw farther um, jump higher kind of thing yeah and yeah so i got into the exercise science program there uh, started reading research about like sprint track starts like how how far apart to put your feet in the blocks to to optimize block exit velocity that kind of thing um Hmm. So this is like I'm 20, 21 years old. I don't really know much about exercise science yet, but I'm digging into all the literature that's that applies to me. Uh, and that's sort of what allowed me to write training plans for myself and experiment on myself, um, yeah, and become more successful um, in in pretty much all avenues of athletics. Um, Interesting. Yeah, how, so. how, how much of it for you was, you know, kind of – coming into your own athletically versus it kind of sounds like programming and assessing like biomechanics um, and kind of like really just optimizing where your base level of athleticism was. I guess that's what I'm asking. Is it, you know, finally like you just hit kind of like your athletic peak and you really were kind of head and shoulders above a lot of folks, or would you say it was more about like intelligent training, optimization of form, and like you said, start mechanics, things of that nature? Yeah, so I, that's a great question. I have always held that I'm I am not the most gifted athlete. I hmm. have definitely been given some gifts, and I think like my parents are both uh, sort of like Northern European, big, big, strong. Um, well-muscled folks like I, yeah. I always tell people like my grandmother beat me in arm wrestling like when I was <laughs> in high school uh, so I, I come from, I come from some stronger folks uh, but I and my genetics are are that but I I wasn't gifted with speed like blazing speed like I was I was easily when I was on the on team USA for bobsled I was easily the slowest guy on the team um, oh, interesting but I just managed to um, yeah use my I think use my intelligence and and competitive drive to to test well uh, and end up contributing on the team really well um, when I, when I was on it. See, and I think that probably gives people listening like hope, right? Because if if the answer had just been no, you know, I just kind of came into my own and just <laughs> yeah. like athletically, I was just you know above everyone else. They'd be like, ah, oh, shit. Yep. But C- like, certainly there's a ton of athletes that do that. Uh, for sure. For sure. And I, I think what makes it so much more um, intriguing is the fact that through, um, you know, like dedication, research, practice, refining of techniques. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you were able to get to a point where you were you were part of like Team USA. Yep. Yep. Um, so h- actually, you know, what, so what ended up happening with with track? So you get to a point where um, you're breaking the school record. I believe you're a two time All American as well, correct? That's correct. So uh, did did you end up trying to pursue the decathlon at an Olympic level? Yeah, embarrassingly so. So I, like I, I mentioned, I, I'm not the fastest guy, and in decathlon, you have to be fast. Like I, I'm pretty sure I looked up I looked up your high school 100 meter time, and I think it's fast. Oh, God. It's, it's faster than 
my all-time best 100 meters <laughs> to give you a frame of reference. Um, so no, I'm I'm not super fast, and you got to be fast to compete at the Olympic level in the decathlon or even like Olympic trials level. Um, yeah. And so I I spent a couple of years after graduating Western with my master's in exercise science. I, I had spent six years at Western Washington University. I um, I spent a couple of years training for decathlon uh, mm. and and javelin uh, and trying to get faster and. I, I remember my last track meet at Duke two years after I had graduated from Western. So I'm probably 26 now. I'm two years into my PhD program at East Tennessee State University. And I go to Duke and I compete in the 100 to sort of like test out my speed. How am I doing on all this development? And I'm no faster. And it's like, uh, I, I so not, not only am I like crushed as an athlete, um, but I'm also like crushed a bit as a second year PhD student in sports science like why can't I make myself faster um and right well, it was it was hard uh, so it it boils it boiled down to um the first year of my PhD program I spent doing some really stupid training training too with too much emphasis on like body composition and hypertrophy mm. muscle growth um and not enough emphasis on speed and power and yeah. then second year I, it just boiled down to like I didn't have stiff enough, springy enough ankles and I was never going to because it's just not a genetic gift that I was given for that like raw speed where you see, you see somebody run and, and you're like, that guy's really light on his feet. That, right. that was never me. Like I was never the light on his feet guy. Um, so at that point, I just decided I'm going to I'm going to see because I was like 205 pounds, uh, maybe 210 at the time. I just okay. decided I'm going to see how big and fast I can get just for the fun of it R rather than rather than seeing how well I can score at the decathlon or mm -hmm. shooting for the Olympic trials anymore. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to have a, a fun, like sort of science experiment and see like how, how much, how much muscle weight can I gain and still run as fast as I do. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I had no inclination that that might be good for bobsled at all. Cause I, I had heard that, bobsledders were sort of freak athletes like and i didn't really consider myself a freak at the time i just thought i was a kind of fast kind of strong good throwing decathlon decathlete yeah uh, so um uh, my wife my wife heard that one of our oh by the way my wife was in the the same academic program with me at both western and etsu and um so she was in the sports science program with me Oh, okay. um, and one of our colleagues, she heard that he was going to go do a bobsled combine. Um, and I, I, I was like, okay, that's cool. And she, she said, well, I looked at the combine scores and that's, that's like an NFL combine, but it's for bobsled. Um, okay. And she's like, I look at the combine scores and it looks like you are like pretty close to national team, national caliber bobsled level. And I was like, I, get lost basically <laughs> respectfully <laughs> not my wife at the time um right right but, right. but um and i didn't actually say get lost um uh, well, no we heard it here it's on it's on record <laughs> but that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's but that's what i was thinking i was like i, I don't need another failure i don't need an, i need i don't need another like years of struggle um, yeah. from like my post-collegiate track career and so she she eventually she kept pushing and pushing and talent ID is sort of something she's gifted at. Um, mm. She kept pushing and basically convinced me to go to this bobsled combine, um, and so I I was like okay I'll take the summer and I'll train I'll train up I'll shift my training from just being generally big and fast to like just test prep for the bobsled combine which is uh, a few sprints, an underhand shot toss. Uh, a broad jump and uh, let's see, and a power clean and a squat. Uh, oh, interesting. So I trained up for that. And I think the year that I did it, I ended up scoring the number three uh, rookie or the number three combine score in the country um, that year, which was a surprise. Uh, wow. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really expect that. Um, and then I got, I got called by uh, one of the team USA bobsled coaches uh, which I remember like being blown away. Um, and he asked me to come to rookie push championships, which is where they bring up all of the, the combine 
participants who scored over a certain threshold and they bring them to Lake Placid, New York, uh, and have them <laughs> push, so great. push a bobsled on a, on a track, uh, for time, basically solo. So you're, mm. you're set up behind a sled, you push it as fast as you can and they measure how fast that bobsled covers the next 35 meters or something like that. Um, and I ended up winning, uh, rookie national push championships uh, wow which was another huge surprise for me and at that point i had no idea what that meant and i was just like well that went pretty well that's surprising um <laughs> yeah so, so go ahead so i mean what because to your point and it's funny now that we have disney plus my kids just got introduced to cool runnings nice. um which of course was just one of my favorite movies as a kid me but too. you know, to your point, right? It, it like my perception of what makes uh, an elite bobsledder is like blazing speed, and because maybe maybe everything I know about bobsled is framed by cool running. So, apologize if I my ignorance. Uh, no, here. that's a, a a strong perception in the sport too. Yeah. So you know what what was it? Uh, knowing kind of how calculated you are about everything, like mm -hmm. what was it that kind of about your unique skill set that enabled you to be number one at, at that what was it the push championships yeah or the, the uh, push? number one at the rookie national push championships it, so it sounds like it, there's more more about i mean kind of obviously more than just like a need for sheer speed right there's some blend of like power explosiveness strength yeah yep absolutely so for the listeners who don't know me at all um my doctoral dissertation uh, was not complete at the time of of doing this rookie national push championships, but hmm. um, my the topic of my dissertation, like a 300 page paper was uh, eventually, it wasn't even conceived at the time of this push championships, but eventually became uh, what characteristics make uh, an international caliber bobsledder. So basically what, <laughs> what things go into uh, making you really good at pushing a bobsled. Um, yeah. So I wrote a 300 page paper on that. Uh, <laughs> super exciting stuff. <laughs> and surprisingly it's got like, it's been downloaded, I don't know, 2000 times, which is blows my mind. Um, oh, incredible. But uh, anyway, I, at the, at the time I went to rookie national push championships, I had no inclination of what made, um, what made a fast bobsledder i just figured hmm. you had to be fast and you had to be really strong and powerful obviously um because the sled's heavy presumably yeah. and uh and and i learned while i was there that uh some degree of well a large degree of pushing technique was important and i i happened to have studied like acceleration mechanics a lot in my undergraduate and master's program so i was i was really able to quickly pick up on the technique um, and become proficient in it, which I think gave me a leg up on all the other rookies because when we were called up to Lake Placid for this push camp, um, we were we were there for one week. There was a one week training camp and at the end of the one week we were tested. It was na the national championships for rookies. And so uh, two big things played in my favor. Uh, one, I was smart enough to figure out the technique really fast and mm -hmm. two, I, uh, I was smart enough to back off the training in the second half of the training camp so that my fatigue would reduce by the time we tested. Uh, yeah. And I would actually be able to exploit some of the training that was given rather than just showing up to the National Push Championships dead tired from the two days that everybody had been pulling. Uh, so that, that played into my hand pretty well. That, and that's where some of the sports science came in handy because I, I was there as a second year PhD student in sports science. Um, I knew what I was doing. I'm I'm just envisioning like a mad scientist. Yeah, that's that's me. Basically, just uh, like finding like the areas for op, you know uh, optimization yeah. in the sport and just exploiting them. Um, so so that's incredible. So can you talk a little bit about uh, your actual bobsled career? Because uh, I mean, you you made Team USA and you competed at World Championships and, and had some success. Yeah, I. I when I won that rookie national push championships, I had no idea what it meant um, until I remember uh, my PhD advisor, Dr. Brad Deweese uh, at ETSU, uh, did have some connections with USA Bobsled, and oh, I remember okay. him. He told he told Michelle, my wife, well, my fiance at the time, I think. Um, he told her as I was training 
um, training for the real national push championships that I got invited to because I won rookies. Um, mm. He told her he's not coming back. Meaning oh, this was down at ETSU where mm. I was in, in school still slated to finish my PhD a year from now. Um, and like I was supposed to be on track academically. Um, and right. <laughs> he, he tells her uh, like he's not coming back, meaning he he's going to be recruited by the team and he's going to go compete internationally. And that was my first like uh, sort of like, holy smokes, this is maybe bigger than I thought it was yeah. uh, moment because he's basically saying I'm going to give up my like without even talking to me. He knew that I was going to give up my Ph.D., uh, for the time being and, and go compete, which right. ended up, ended up being true. And yeah, I went up to national push championships, uh, in Lake Placid again, a month later. And, um, I got second place there. Uh, and I, I'm trying to remember, let's see, I got, I got second place at nationals and it was at that point, the national team coach brian scheimer this is the head coach of the u.s national team like i have known who brian scheimer was like since the i don't know 2002 olympics where he won a bronze medal in bobsled and it was like the first american four-man uh, bobsled medal i remember Which, that i mean the the guy like everybody who knows anything about bobsled knows who brian scheimer is and people probably knew who steve holcomb was uh, the late steve holcomb um hmm. he's a he's a he was the USA one bobsled pilot, like first, first guy to win gold, um, for the U S in like 60 years or something. Um, Incredible. anyway, Brian Scheimer head coach tells me like after the national team meeting where they discuss like, um, like what the next process is for determining the team. It, they go over, all of the selection and how the pilots are going to make selections and how there's going to be team trials and how like you're going to have all the rookies are going to have to contend with all the national team, former national team athletes. And it was a really, it was a big stressful meeting basically saying like, okay, you guys have a lot of work to do to get on the national team. And he walks up to me after the meeting and it's basically like, you're on team, U you're on USA one. So not just team USA, but the top bobsled of the three national team bobsleds, you are automatically on it. Uh, and so I'm like, I look at him, I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like this, I honestly, I thought that he'd either make an, made a mistake or it was like maybe over guaranteeing what he was qualified to guarantee. This is the head coach. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I did end up racing for Steve Holcomb and we won, we won a bunch of races on the North America cup. Um, hmm. And then, yeah, went over to Europe and I slid on everything USA 1, USA 2, and USA 3 throughout Europe and ended up at world championships. I ended up on USA 2, which I think is a better place for a rookie bobsledder to be at world championships. And yeah, it was a sort of a big whirlwind of six months going from like never, or well, maybe nine months of never having considered bobsled as a sport to do to I'm at world championships competing against like people I've seen on TV talking, right. talking, shaking hands with John Morgan. Like if you know, bobsled, he's like the announcer who's announced bobsled for the last 30 years at the Olympics. <laughs> he like pays for my laundry in some Altenburg hotel. Like, I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> oh, I mean all in under a year. Yeah. Yep. Like you, like, it sounds like you went from thinking your athletic career, at least competitively was kind of wrapping up and you're yep. just going to start For experimenting sure. on yourself to now you're on an Olympic track competing yep. at world championships. Yep. So what is, what I've always been curious, what is training for the bobsled look like? And I, and I, I'm interested in everything from, you know, like, did, did you have to move? It sounds like you had to leave school for the time being. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm interested in like specifically, like what sort of training are you guys doing to excel at that sport? Yeah. The, the simplest way to put it is we trained like hundred meter sprinters and Olympic weightlifters uh, with a, like a touch of bodybuilding. So okay. lots of speed, lots of strength and power, just like you would need in weightlifting. And enough bodybuilding to retain a really high amount of muscle mass because hmm. you the bigger you are the less weight you actually have to push in the sled the way the the way the sport works is you've got a four man crew and for that four man crew the total weight of the crew plus the sled uh dictates 
there, there's a total weight limit. And so you can have ah. your sled weigh a large portion portion of it, or you can have your guys weigh a large portion of it. Well, intuitively, you can figure out that big guys pushing a lighter sled will be faster than small guys pushing a heavier sled. Yep. So, yeah, that's where the bodybuilding aspect comes in, uh, and it pays to have that weight not be fat. So you want muscle. Um, so that's that's why you you do some of the accessory body bodybuilding stuff. But the like ninety percent of the training is Olympic weightlifting type stuff and sprinting. Got it. And then the three guys who are not the driver, and mm -hmm. now like okay, what, what do we call them? Break. What was the what was the term you used? Brakeman. Yep. Brakeman. Okay. Um, are they all serving generally the same function? Yep. Make the sled okay. go as fast as possible, as fast as possible. Got it. And then how about the driver? Does he have to keep up his end of the bargain? Yeah. So the, the drivers also are required to push and it definitely behooves them to be <laughs> large, strong, fast, powerful men. Uh, but if you're an ex exceptionally skilled pilot, sometimes you can get away with being like just an above average, large, strong, fast, powerful guy rather than <laughs> sort of world class. Got it. Got it. So, you know, uh, and now I'm just I'm just intrigued to understand, like what happens once you actually get in the sled as a as a brakeman? You get out of the wind first and foremost. So okay. aerodynamics is everything when you're going 60 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour without an engine because you can't overcome any of the losses of speed that you might create with sticking your head up um, because there's no engine to reaccelerate you. You're relying purely on gravity to take you down the, the hill as fast as possible. So you have to maintain your speed. So when you're in the sled, you just tuck your head, tuck your shoulders and like hug the guy in front of you basically yeah. um, and you're, you're basically like four guys in a bathtub for real just like the cool runnings movie um <laughs> except except it's a smaller bathtub and you're really really up close to the guy in front of you and your head is buried in their back uh, and you're just like holding your breath uh hoping the driver has a nice trip down the track oh, okay so do you have any inclination as to like when the turns are coming like how to lean um uh, do you know what I mean? Is that choreographed yeah. or is that, is that more feel or is it, is there an element of study that goes into it pre a specific track? Yeah. So as brakeman, you don't actually lean. So they got that wrong in the movie. Um, oh, that was come on. Big, John Candy. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we, we basically brace for the turns, but um, we don't lean because it, essentially you want to become a part of the sled. So just hmm. you want to be a fixed object in the sled doing nothing um so sometimes yeah we definitely study the track to know when the turns are coming which direction they are so that you like don't get surprised by the direction that your head gets knocked into the sled wall because you okay. i mean it's a really rough ride um your head's getting hit on the, the sled cowling um and i mean you're getting jarred around a lot the ice isn't perfectly smooth it's not like a skating rink it's like yeah. uh it's sort of like being on a roller coaster with stutter bumps so like really <laughs> jarring um, and yeah, you just, you become a part of the sled and uh, you can't see anything. You just hold your breath and, and hang on tight for a minute. Yeah. Oh man. It's just, it just looks, uh, it looks like a lot of fun. I don't know if it is because what you just described is a lot <laughs> more jarring than most people probably anticipate. I would but say I'm, I'm less just thinking fun about the rush. It yeah, it, is it? The, okay. rush, the rush is sweet. Like you, you get down to the bottom of the track, and yeah, it feels like you just want to like rip your sled in half. You're on like a big, like emotional high. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what ended up happening? So you're, so you're running with team one, team two, team three, going to world championships. Um, the 2018 Olympics are on the horizon at some point. I'm not, I'm a little, I forget what year we're on here, but I mean, you're, you're on the path to go to the Olympics. Yep. Yep. I, uh, I, I decided to take a year off to just okay. train. Um, so not, it wasn't like a year off, like, oh, I'm going to go just like start my career. No, it was a year off to just simply You weren't train. going backpacking through Europe. <laughs> no, no, I was going home. <laughs> I, I actually built a bobsled push track, uh, behind a gym that my wife and I started. Um, oh, cool. So we, we, I built a facility that was multi-purpose. It, it allowed me to train and it allowed me to coach youth athletes and make a living, start making a living. Mm. Uh, which was super fun. So I, I took that year off 
um, with the intent of coming back the the next year, like a big a bigger, faster, stronger version of me. And the the reason it was so pivotal, so key to I think take a year off to become faster and stronger and larger um, and more muscular, more powerful, all of that was um, it, when when you're training when you're training in season with the bobsled team in these mountain towns in Europe, it's these towns don't have gyms. Like uh. you're, you're in, you're in a ski resort town that doesn't have a gym that has Olympic weightlifting or bumper plates or, or barbells. They just have like some, some machines. So the bobsled team brings weights. We bring squat stands, barbells and uh, weight plates to Europe in vans. Well, on a ship, uh, mm -hmm. When we ship over our sleds, we drive them around in vans and we set those squat stands up and those rusty barbells, like the Team USA sets up rusty barbells in the middle of a street or a parking lot or a parking garage uh, in like 30 degree temperatures and does our Olympic lifting in snow clothes. So it's less optimal training when you're on tour than when you're back home in the comfort of your own gym, training at any hour you want with perfect nutrition and all of that. Yeah. So, well, and actually something, something I wanted to ask you. So after, you know, being on the bobsled team, did you alter your training at all um, based on either like direction from the team or did you continue to write your own programming and you'd kind of been able to hone in? And again, now, now I'm, as I say this, remembering your dissertation was on what makes a good elite bobsledder. Um, like to what extent did you continue to do your own programming and, and did you modify it at all? Yeah, 100% did my own programming until Olympic year uh, when okay. I actually had my wife uh, write my own my, my programming and she was the only person in the world I would trust to do that. Um, and I had I had Dr. DeWeese at East Tennessee State write my programming for a couple of months mm. um, because he, he was formerly the strength and conditioning coach for the Team USA bobsled team and he writes good programming, but it was just better to have um, I, I thought, and I, I still think that probably it's it's good to have somebody who knows you really well and is also mm. expert at like training, sports science, nutrition, all of that. Write your training programming. Um, so that's why I hired unofficially my wife to write all my programming. And honestly, when she started writing my programming, I got better faster than when I was writing my own training, um, just because I think oh, some honest outside influence was good. All right, we've got a deviate course here. I got I got to hear more about your wife because right now what I've picked up from this interview is she's an elite cyclist. She is writing the program for you uh, <laughs> yeah. as as an international like a potentially Olympic bobsledder. Um, you know what 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 is she doing today? She also consults for RP actually uh, for awesome. Renaissance. Yeah, so she she's first. Uh, before she takes on a bunch of clients, um, she's she's got a few right now. But before she takes on a, a a larger client load, she's finishing up her RD. So she's got a master a master's degree in sports science. But um, oh, awesome. she's going to get her registered dietitian, uh, I guess registration or license, and so she's going to be a dietitian. Um, and so she's not only is she as good as me at sports science, but she's also better than me at, at nutrition coaching, even though I've, I've coached way more people than her. She's actually got <laughs> letters after her name that say she's good at coaching nutrition. <laughs> I can't even imagine what sitting around the dinner table is with, with the two of you. Yeah, it's, we've had some comments from people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. And then she's an athlete as well, I, yeah. I have to assume. Yeah, yeah. So she's... I mean, but beyond the cycling uh, yeah, prior so to she, that. She was a track athlete, um, a track athlete at Western as well. Uh, okay. I think... I don't know if she held any school records there who was super close. Um, but she also made the, the bobsled team the year that I did. Um, no kidding. She hated bobsled. <laughs> she, it's, it's a team sport and she's like not really willing to be somebody's slave, which on the women's <laughs> side, it was honestly, there was a lot of like uh, hierarchy and uh, I would say drama to put it nicely. So she got out of there as fast as she could. Got it. Oh, wow. So, so you take that year off, uh, leading up to the Olympic year, I guess, uh, I, I would love to hear kind of like what happens from then. Yeah. So I, I went back two years later for the Olympic year. Um, and long, long story short, I decided that, that second year, um, was going to be another training year and then I would show up for Olympic year. So I go back for national push championships for the Olympic year. Um, I'm as big and fast as I've ever been. I think I was 225 
I think I I can't remember my exact numbers, but I think I power cleaned about 375 pounds and power snatched maybe uh, 285, 290. Uh, and I ha had a 40 inch vertical and uh, benched roughly 400 pounds. So I was I was in the best shape of my life. I go back. You had a 40 inch vertical. Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, how how much of that was just built upon over time? Or I mean, well, you know I what I mean? Or were, or were you always a great jumper? I tested my vertical my first day of weight training class in high school, and I jumped 19 inches. <laughs> okay. So, so this is a, a progression. Yeah. A, a, let's see, a 14-year progression. Yep. Oh, wow. And I mean, was how, how did you kind of achieve that level of explosiveness? Because here's here's one of the interesting topics that's come up. Um, and I'd love to get you to weigh in on it. And I know I'm taking away from your story, so I apologize. No, no, but no, go for it. It's, you know, there's kind of that argument between like to what extent uh, does like static weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting actually contribute to making a, a better, more explosive athlete? Mm -hmm. um, and to what extent does it actually, uh, you know, what's the right word I'm looking for here, but actually like prevent someone you know, like there, there's that balance of like strength and speed and it's like you can go too far in one direction. Yeah, absolutely. That's I would say that's one of the bigger misconceptions I experienced as a baseball player. And okay. honestly, a lot of my coaches had huge misconceptions about that, too. And I think that I'm a, a living, breathing example of th those misconceptions being debunked big time. So people hmm. people often think that sort of strength and speed uh, are on two different ends of a continuum. And I would yeah. argue, I would argue that muscularity and speed are on two different ends of a continuum. It's, it's very hard oh. to be very fast and extremely muscular at the same time. But if you look at the fastest people in the world, they are without exception, some of the strongest people in the ranges of motion that they use in their sport yeah. in the world. So like, Jonathan Edwards, if you're familiar with the triple jump, he's the world record holder in the triple jump. He weighed, I think, a buck fifty, sopping wet, real mm -hmm. skinny, lanky guy. He could power clean 335 pounds. No kidding. Like, I mean, he's he's six one, 150 pounds. Like, this guy is strong. That's incredible. Yeah. So, if you if you want to jump higher, run faster, you should get strong. You shouldn't maybe get muscular but you should absolutely get strong and mm. you basically do that by just reducing the volume of training that you do so maybe don't do so much bodybuilding style training don't don't do so many like sets in the 8 to 12 8 to 15 rep range I do a whole bunch of training in like the 3 to 5 rep range and you'll get stronger over time and you will probably get faster and better at jumping over time and that's what that's what I did so and and it's interesting, right? Because uh, I mean, I met you through Tom and we do that decathlon. I, and it's, it might be a product of my age now. I'm 33. Um, to stay, well, let's say relatively quick. Yep. <laughs> and I use, I use relative uh, because I'm I, by no means elite. Um, you know, I, I dialed back the strength training portion. And now I'm wondering if that was uh, incorrectly so, because what I found is like, I just, I do put on weight much easier. So I think today, I don't know, I, I think I'm like 227. Oh, that's a great uh, point. You know, and so I'm like, ah, like I need to kind of maintain this balance. Uh, and, I'm, and I find that if I do too much strength tra training in my lower body, like I really kind of blow up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and so I've been doing a lot more and I just, I like doing plyometrics. Um, you know, so I do a lot more of that sort of training, or maybe I'll do like French contrast training. And now I, I'm wondering, you know, maybe should I not have, have stopped doing that so soon? Maybe I just wasn't applying it correctly. Maybe. Yeah. I think, uh, maybe reducing the total training volume, like how much, how many total sets, how many total reps of strength training that you're doing is super useful. And you're probably, you're probably experiencing uh, a better exploitation of your physical capacity because you reduced your strength training. So you, you're able to like, you're able to jump higher next week when you mm -hmm. stop squatting. Like if you, if you want to, if you want to jump higher or run faster or, or be able to express any of your physical abilities, you have to reduce fatigue and you have to reduce conflicting uh, stimuli. So strength training right now like if i strength train if i do squats right now as an elite athlete who's super well muscled um mm -hmm. 
I'm not going to jump higher tomorrow because of it, but it right. does lay the foundation for six months from now, a year from now, when I start reducing my strength training volume and increasing my plyos or increasing my running for those things to get way better. Yeah. So that, and I th I feel like that's like a good breadcrumb there that you, you just kind of said. So it's like, th there does need to be that reduction and stop me if I start putting words into your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds like there does need to be that reduction as as you get closer towards your competition and you want to actually like express that speed um, yep, absolutely. You know, via the strength gains. Okay. Uh, so I think that helps provide some clarity. And, uh, you know, I definitely I definitely want to wrap up, uh, not wrap up, but I, I definitely want to be able to let you finish your story about the Olympic bobsliding. But maybe yeah. this is a, a great way to dovetail into what you're doing today because I think people would be really interested to hear about what you do with uh, Renaissance periodization. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So the, 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 what do you call it? The, the tapering or the, the reduction in training volume that is necessary for exploitation of the speed that you've laid the foundation for that mm -hmm. all, that all comes into like a good annual plan. So the bulk of mm -hmm. an annual plan should be spent laying the foundation for something that you're going to exploit when you go to compete peak, whatever. Um, yeah. And yeah, strength training is, is a, a, pr a pretty, I'm, I won't put it, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Strength training is, is the best foundation for just about anything. Um, yeah. Whether it's speed, uh, muscularity in the future, endurance, even, um, mm. Yeah, strength training lays the foundation. So that's what I do with a lot of my clients. Um, a lot, and honestly, like I have a ton of clients who come to me from CrossFit or functional fitness, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. And their goal is is either compete better in that uh, fitness sport or, or be better at X, Y, or Z, be better at running, be better at cycling, or maybe they want to look better. Um, and almost always I have to tell people, uh, and I do tell my clients and convince them of this, that you're going to have to strength train more. Like you, you have mm. to reduce, you're going to need to reduce the amount of time that you spend doing a wad or reduce the amount of time that you spend doing plyos or reduce the amount of time that you spend running just a touch um, and emphasize the strength training more um, to, to be able to sort of break through the plateau that you've been stuck at for the last two years because you've been doing the training that is purely conducive to the thing that you want and never mm -hmm. laying a foundation for it. Ah, that's great. That's great. That, and that, that makes a lot of sense, I think. So yeah, so, I, coach, I coach a lot of folks one-on-one -on -one, um, at, at RP. That's that's sort of like the, the meat and potatoes of my job is I, I write diet and training plans for people um, remotely send them via email and then I work with them on uh, sometimes their technique via video video or, or just making sure their reps are in the right range for the training that I write and then I monitor their progress that sort of thing yeah and, and so what what sort of athletes are you working with and you mentioned you know CrossFit or people in functional fitness but it, what, and the reason I ask and what I think is so interesting is you have now kind of like two well I mean really three backgrounds because you were a decathlete but uh, you were on that very explosive end of the spectrum for bobsled but now um, you know in addition to the cycling that you do you also compete in triathlons so are you writing programs uh, for athletes on all ends of the spectrum Yes. So I am, I am the lead RP endurance consultant, mm -hmm. which is like such a huge contrast to what the rest of my life spent doing before age like 29, 30 was. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm that's kind of what out. I was getting at. Like, I was like, this is so interesting because he's the endurance guy. Yep. Yet he is like a world-class athlete in a very specific explosive sport. Yeah. In a sport that lasts where your physical effort lasts five seconds or less. Right, right, right. Yeah, so I, uh, because my wife was uh, interested in triathlon after doing her short stint with the bobsled team, which mm -hmm. totally unrelated skills, like you just mentioned. So that was a big transition. She she wrote her own programming for the first year of her training. It was sort of her retirement sport um, in triathlon. But I, once she she's like started winning some stuff. Um, she trains super hard. Um, yeah. I was like, well, hey, I can like I can learn a whole bunch about. Well, I didn't tell her. I started learning a whole bunch about <laughs> endurance, and and when when a person like me, like I'm, in case you haven't noticed, the mad scientist thing is like a that's a pretty good analogy for how I live. Um, so yeah. when I start researching something, I spend 
probably more hours than most people would spend on Google Scholar reading the literature about that topic. So like mm. figuring out like what types of training improve VO2 max for the least amount of fatigue, where they fit in the macro cycle, like the annual plan, um, mm -hmm. how to how to actually structure training programs around the athlete's psychology, like in their, their um, what's the word? like their predisposition to like responding well to certain types of training. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, can I ask, we had, yeah. uh, it, 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 we had Christian Thibodeau on the podcast. Um, and I feel like when you said that he has a system called neurotyping hmm. is it in a similar vein of trying to understand, you know, like what are they predisposition to respond to? I think more, more from a, a psychological sense uh, rather than a, a nervous system sense. So mm. well, more like, um, like cer certain athletes, if if I go tell them to run three miles at threshold, like they will lose their mind because that is the most <laughs> boring thing in the plan on the planet for them to do. Um, yeah. And those those athletes often just like they quit endurance training because it sucks, <laughs> and they're like they're like this is boring. Um, but they often like my wife. My wife is one of those people. She she's if if I tell her you need to do twenty something for twenty minutes straight, it's like that's like pulling teeth and she mm. competes in bike races that are like three, yeah. hour, three hours long. Um, so she has to be able to do steady state things uh, like intense things uh, with intense pain for long durations with a great amount of focus, but mm -hmm. you can get at those things physiologically by doing things like intervals. Um, I mean, there's no shortcut. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to be in pain. You're going to have to, like push yourself uh, really hard and like stick with it when it gets uh, pretty intense and the pain the pain becomes like uh, not life altering but like serious. Um, mm -hmm. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to do that, but you can break it up into intervals that still stimulate the systems that you need. Um, and so that's that's what I spent all that time learning about was like how to write training programs for people like who don't who aren't Lance Armstrong or Chris Froome or, or Mo Farah, like they're not, they're not these people who are, are just predisposed to enjoying three hours of doing the same thing nonstop. Yeah. Like most of us don't enjoy that. Sure. The best endurance athletes in the world usually do, but if you want to be really fit, you can get really fit by doing shorter things more intensely with intelligent design. Interesting. So, it's funny because it's like, and maybe I'm overgeneralizing it. I, I, you know, we've often hear about things in terms of like slow twitch athlete versus mm -hmm. a fast twitch athlete. Mm -hmm. And someone who's slow twitch naturally uh, lends himself to performing better in an endurance event. And now yep. using your wife as an example, right? She yep. also is on the bobsled team. So I, you know, most Very people do like Right. Yet it sounds like, and I don't know if overcome is the right word. Uh, is, maybe, is it maybe like- utilize. Oh, utilize oh, okay yeah can you talk about that a little bit yeah so she 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 takes advantage of her fast twitch like speed power ability on the bike and it's mm. super easy to take a fast twitch well not super easy not easy for them easy as a coach it's easy to take a fast twitch athlete and turn them into a good endurance athlete it's not easy to take a slow twitch athlete and turn them into a strength power or speed athlete. You can okay. turn them into a strength athlete maybe, and certainly a muscular athlete. Um, but it's, it's harder to take a slow twitch athlete, impossible to take a slow twitch athlete and make them Usain Bolt. Yeah. Uh, but you can take, you can like if you could convince Usain Bolt to run a marathon and actually train smart for it, he'd be a pretty good marathoner. And I know that there's lots of people that would love to debate me on that, but the truth is you can convert fiber types from fast twitch to slow twitch or slower mm. twitch and more oxidative, more aerobic, but you can't, you can't go the other way um, yeah. to a greater extent than your genetics like first allowed you. So if you're born with like 50, 50, you're not going to have, more than 50% fast twitch fibers ever in your life. Usain Bolt yeah. was given the gift of, let's say 80, just generally 80% fast twitch fibers, 20% slow twitch. He, he can have, like he could, he could train for a marathon and convert a ton of those fast twitch fibers to really oxidative aerobic fibers and develop a huge aerobic fitness uh, and, and also reap the benefits of still having a great kick at the end of the race. Hmm. So that makes me wonder, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't know to what extent it's, you know, snake oil and, and just marketing, but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, 
is there an opportunity for people, um, whether they're still trying to be a, a highly competitive athlete or maybe they're, you know, I hate to say like thinking about kids because I don't want to send a bunch of kids, people start experimenting on their kids. Uh, <laughs> I think there's enough pressure on youth athletes as there is, but 100%. Is, is there an opportunity to like actually assess what your general ratio is of like fast for slow twitch? Oh, sure. Yeah. Are, are you the fastest kid on the playground? If you are, you're pretty fast twitch. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm dead serious. Like if yeah. you, the re, the reason Michelle actually quit track and field is because she she went to a, a local, local track meet. This is, she's like done two years of post-collegiate training, just like I did. She went to a local track meet and she looked around and there were kids who clearly had no training, like mm -hmm. no nice equipment. And they were just slaughtering other kids who like, whose parents might've invested a lot in them. They had all the nice gear. They had like yep. beautiful technique and they were just slower. The The beautiful technique kids were just slower than the other kids. And mm. Michelle, Michelle remembers thinking like, okay, I, I've been competing at sprinting for the last 12 years of my life. And I'm where I'm at today. I've done some really smart training to get here. I'm not elite now. Like it's never going to happen. I wasn't, I wasn't that kid. I've always been the kid who's been grinding. She yeah. certainly wasn't gifted from her parents, but or and didn't have like nice sprint spikes when she was growing up but she was the kid that like spent time studying technique and spent time like rehearsing and rehearsing in the winter in the snow and like she grind she grinded for everything she had mm -hmm. and yeah she still wasn't the fastest so it was that realization that uh, yeah, that led her to actually move on and become go go do endurance sports which she loves now oh Okay, so it's it's fairly, uh, I guess the right word is obvious, um, to kind of what end of the spectrum you kind of uh, find yourself, right? Like yeah, if, if you are the fastest kid on the playground, quote unquote, yep. you're probably mostly fast twitch. 100%. Uh, and then there's probably a lot of people who are kind of in the middle and you just kind of figure it out as you go. And then there's some people who are obviously more like slow twitch dominant, lend yes. themselves better to endurance. Okay. Yep. All right, so I don't need to start a fast twitch, slow twitch testing company is what you're telling me? That's correct. Yeah, you can just <laughs> go watch kids. Yep. Uh, okay, whole other set of problems there, but point taken. I would say, uh, I would say the only exception to that is yeah. uh, if if the kid or person happens to be overweight, um, they mm. might actually be fast twitch and still be slower than – but if, if – uh, barring being overweight, then – yeah, that holds absolutely true, and it's probably the best test. Like, how fast can you run from here to there? That's the best test for fiber typing when you're a kid. Got it. Got it. Okay, listeners will absolutely bombard me with email if, if I don't let you finish the story about what happened with your bobsled career. Oh, yeah. Um, it's very I, I, I'll, I'll Well, <laughs> okay, but I completely derailed you, so I apologize. But, uh, yeah, I, I would love to hear because it sounds like, you know, everything was gearing towards 2018 – would love to hear what what kind of what what happened. Yeah, so I I did uh, well enough at the uh, the Olympic uh, national team push championships to be in the pool of selected athletes for Team USA. So I get selected by the USA two pilot, uh, who mm. happens to be the same pilot that I pushed for back in 2015, um, through two or three years earlier at World Championships. Um, I got selected by him to basically try out for his sled. Uh, hmm. And the guy I was trying out against was uh, Ryan Bailey, essentially. Um, the the other guys for the two other spots on his sled were sort of, I think, uh, picked at the time. Um, so it was me against Ryan Bailey. And uh, there, there was another guy who, who also made the team. But uh, long, long story short, Ryan Bailey is uh, – Gosh, I think he's a silver medalist in the hundred meter dash at the Olympics. Um, yeah, I was just pulling him up. <laughs> yeah, I was so like, I know that. I know that name. Why do I know it? Oh, yeah, because he he's like and ran he's a nine eight eight. The, yeah, he's run nine eight eight, and he's also the biggest sprinter ever to set foot at the Olympic Games in the hundred meter dash. He's he's oh really? Yeah, yeah. He's like six five two twenty. Usain Bolt is much leaner, much more uh, slender of frame. So Ryan Bailey is like. Uh, a gift to bobsled. Um, oh, wow. Anyway, so we're we're trying out for this Team USA sled, and on the first push, uh, I'm on the left side, and I sprint down the, the ice track, and I feel my left foot, no, 
gosh, it's been a few years. I feel my right foot crack and I feel uh. my, the skin of, sorry, trigger warning folks, uh, <laughs> the skin of my, my ankle, the skin of my foot folds like at the front of my ankle because my foot like comes up to my shin basically uh. um, because I broke, I broke the bone called your calcaneus uh in my heel um yeah i snapped that in half uh when i jumped into the sled and so i jump into the sled and i ride down this short hill thankfully thank god i was on a push track and not an actual bobsled track so the push track you just go down and then you come up and the sled stops there's no uh there's no like one minute long ride where you have to hold your breath and tuck your head so i just i stood there in the sled in intense pain i couldn't put any weight on my right foot uh, and i i just raised my hand and said uh, i gotta get out of the sled at the other end of the push track um and i knew i knew at that moment i was like well that's that's the end of the road uh oh. I, i'm gonna get to go home now and spend time riding my bike with my wife which i've been looking forward to for three years because as, as a strength an elite strength power athlete you actually have mm -hmm. to limit the amount of cardio that you do if you want to optimize your strength power and speed which you don't have to do if you're not an elite athlete maybe a little yeah. if you want to like spend some time really muscling up but not to the extent that as an elite athlete that you do so i i had spent years limiting the amount of like fun endurance training that i did i never got to go on bike mm. rides with my wife i didn't go hiking i didn't or i did very little hiking and th those are all things i love being from like the pacific northwest i love being outside yeah uh, so it was like a snap moment when my foot snapped uh that that i knew okay that's that's the end i get to go home and i'm gonna focus on the positives and move forward so it was, just, it was just a freak accident yeah so i actually in hindsight i had been running on a stress fracture uh for the wow. better part of two years um and i the symptoms for a stress fractured calcaneus are almost identical to a sprained ankle so i mm. thought i had like a mild low grade sprained ankle um for two years <laughs> and uh it turned out to be a fracture and i didn't find out until that moment oh man yeah. So I pretty, mean, mentally, wild. it sounds it sounds like you have a very positive, uh, and I would even dare to say resilient outlook. Um, I like you know. So. Is that is that just part of your makeup, or is this just like now having the benefit of a couple years to reflect back? Oh no, that was that was for real. That's what happened in my head at that time. I'm very yeah. yeah I guess forward forward thinking, positive. There's no sense in like dwelling or resonating with negative stuff. It's just not mm. comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's only going to harm uh, future outcomes. The best thing to do is ask yourself where you are today and uh, like what's the best case scenario moving forward. See, that might be the most interesting thing we've talked about today because I think there's a lot of folks who, when something like that that, that derails something they've been working towards, you know, they they sink down into that deep hole. Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, and, and I guess, is that something that like has always just kind of been intrinsic for you? Is that something that uh, is just a mindset that you've established for yourself and now it's kind of become second nature? Or I mean, I mean maybe you've never even thought about this. Oh, no, I've thought lots about it. <laughs> okay, yeah, I would, I would, great, maybe, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, I, having coached close to a thousand people now, one-on-one um, mm -hmm. -on -one with RP, I have had... Uh, the luxury of, of sort of seeing into the psychology of a lot of folks and seeing how certain people are resilient and uh, how their results end up panning out three, six, 12 months from now versus yeah. people who maybe are less mentally resilient, either in, by intention or by, by accident, and seeing how their results pan out less well. Um, hmm. So yeah, I would say I've naturally, I've always been generally slightly more positive than negative but it's been it's become very intentional uh in the last five years or so um and, and i think with great results there's it's just not productive or useful or helpful to think negatively about your situation um yeah it's just perfectionism is the death of joy and you, yeah you just if, if you're constantly focused on what you did wrong you're unlikely to move forward at the same rate that you would if you focus on what you did well and just quickly learn from what you did wrong and let that inform future decisions. But 
yeah, you, you'll be much more productive as a human if you can force yourself to focus on like celebrating wins and just quickly learning from what you did wrong rather than sitting with it and resonating on it and like really um, letting it form your attitude. It's just mm. yeah, counterproductive. I love that, man. And I actually think that's probably a great, great place to wrap it up. And I, I hope folks take a lot from that because uh, I think, that, you know, if you can truly adopt that mindset, that serves you well in life, because no matter what you're <laughs> you're going after, where you at in the stage of your life, like challenges are probably the only constant. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, so uh, taking on that kind of mindset, and I love to hear that it's like an intentional choice. You know, what, what I've really enjoyed about this conversation um, is hearing that much of what you've accomplished has been through education, choice, uh, strategy. Yep. And I, I hope that for folks, I know it is for me, um, like I'm fired up to, I don't know, go do something. I got I to work here, actually. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I got to go try and I got to go try and sell some tech. Um, but it's got me fired up. It's like, you know what? No, I, you have control over your destiny. Um, everyone, is, you know, has some sort of ceiling, but you have a say in like how close to that ceiling you can get and how yeah, well you can kind absolutely. of excel within a given uh, skill. Or And that ceiling is probably cool. higher than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, man, this has been fantastic. And I didn't even get to ask you all the stuff I was going to ask you about what you're doing at Renaissance. So maybe someday we'll have you back on the show if you're up for it. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, you know, for people who, who want to know more about you, um, would like to follow you, wh where's a good place for them to do that? I'm on Instagram. I've got uh, my, we can maybe link to my screen name, Xander P. Harrison. Uh, yep. And yeah, the RP website, renaissanceperiodization.com. Perfect. Okay. I'll make sure to link to both of those. Well, uh, thank you, Alex. I, I really appreciate it, man. This has been awesome. Yeah, it's been absolutely my pleasure.